Good day, folks. So good to be here with you once again. Thanks so much for uh, having me in your, wherever you are, whatever places you are right now. Who knows where that is? Only you do. But thanks again. I appreciate that so much. I hope that uh, the messages that come with you with not any eloquent or no eloquent speaking, and I mean that, and then you as well realize that, that in any ways God would take it and bless you and uh, maybe even do a good work in you for his glory. Well, let's continue then. The American research group Barna, which I think you're probably familiar with, uh, hosts a podcast called Church Pulse Weekly. And in one such episode, David uh, Kinnaman had a sit down with Jeannie Allen of If Gathering. Now, If Gathering is, as far as I understand, a gospel ministry centered around uh, women and the younger generations. And on cue for that particular podcast was the topic, the relationship between suffering and spiritual formation. And I just want to just say off the top, just on the side here, when I see this term spiritual formation, I'm often thinking of discipleship, Christian discipleship. But I digress. Anyways, Jeannie Allen went on to suggest that there's no such thing as spiritual formation apart from suffering. Keeping in mind that Allen's context is the American church, Allen went on to say that in her view, the American church has been stunted by comfort. Very interesting statement. And this has resulted in complacency. For Allen would suggest suggest that suffering just might be what Christians and the church needs. It needs to have to wake everybody up in her, pardon me, in her own words. Friends, when we consider the topic of suffering, we're faced with the perennial question human beings have been asking from time immemorial, why does God allow suffering? You might be familiar with that. Rankin Wilborn, in his article, asked the other reoccurring question, why would anyone want to suffer? Wilburn argues that, quote, to see suffering as a gift from God seems far removed from the common expectation of our day. Wilburn correctly and appropriately points out the distortion of God's promises in current Christian culture. You just have to look around. You'll see that if you know your Bible. Things they would say such as, quote, Jesus suffered so that we wouldn't have to. Again, Wilborn. I believe, correctly, uh, calls out this and uses the term a gross platitude. These are platitudes that we see offered by current prosperity gospel platforms and preachers, amongst others as well. That is the false idea that health and wealth, not pain and hardship, are signs seen as God's favor and friendship. And Wilborn really is like a hawk locking talons into the prey. He goes even further he, would, he addresses what he sees as a widespread, widespread, <laughs> I like that, widespread assumption among Christians that suffering is more of an imposition, an interruption of God's good purposes, even a sign of his displeasure. Friends, suffering is seen as an uninvited guest to the party. So as we ponder Jesse Allen's and Rankin Wilborn's points, We are still left with the question of the day, aren't we? Why does God allow suffering? Well, let's throw in Wilburn's question as well for good measure. Why would anyone want to suffer? Well, friends, please turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter as we continue the sermon series that we're calling uh, A Living Hope as we go through uh, Peter's letter here verse by verse and see what the good Lord has for us. So beginning in chapter 1, verse 1, we'll read through to verse 9. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, though through the resurrection, pardon me, of Jesus Christ from the dead, 
to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready uh, to be revealed in the last time. Verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. And now as we continue to look at verses, particularly verse 6 to 9, Lord, would you just set me aside and, and by your spirit, will you just teach us and inform us? And may we take what we learn here and percolate about that maybe over the next couple of days and then put it into action with our feet and our hands not only in our private lives, but in our pub, public lives as well. And we want to do that all, Lord, for the glory, your glory alone. And we thank you, Lord, uh, as you lead us now by your spirit, through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Former pastor and author Tim Keller, uh, who has gone to be with the Lord, said concerning pain and suffering, quote, nothing is more important than to learn how to maintain a life of purpose in the midst of painful adversity. His life is a testament to uh, maintaining a life of purpose in adversity, if you know his story. So in Keller's view, our Western culture fails to give its citizens any explanation of suffering. And when it comes to times and seasons of painful adversity, Western culture provides little and no, or no guidance on how to deal with adversity. After all, as I'm sure we're, you're aware of this, the secular culture maintains one worldview with a tight grip, that the material world is all that exists. So out of that worldview, the meaning of life then is to have the freedom to choose a life that brings the most happiness to you or me. And with this view of life, pain and suffering really have no meaningful part in it. To Rankin Wilborn's uh, point, pain and suffering is a complete, according to Keller, interruption of our lives. It is to be avoided at best or minimized at least. Yet when life brings pain and sorrow and suffering, where does one go? Keller goes on to suggest that secular folks then would beg and borrow and steal from other views of life, other worldviews such as from other religions or other places. Even though, if you think about this, their materialistic view viewpoint our worldview doesn't line up with those resources they're seeking to help them. And I just was wondering about that in Keller's comments uh, about another question that came in my mind is how do ancient how did ancient cultures view pain and suffering? How did they find a satisfactory answer to the question why does God allow suffering? Well, with all this in mind, uh, let's turn our attention to the Apostle Peter's letter. We're going to be specifically dealing Mainly here, verses three, uh, verses three, verse six to nine. This was a letter that was penned by Apostle Peter. Did I say Paul? I probably said Paul. I mix those up. Apostle Peter it was a letter that he penned over two thousand years ago. A letter written to an ancient uh, Near Eastern culture, far removed from our twenty-first century uh, Western context. And up to this point in our sermon series, we have discovered the Apostle Peter was writing his letter to encourage Christians uh, dispersed throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, how do we know that they were Christians? I think that's a good question. Well, let's let the Apostle of Jesus Christ, as he calls himself, explain this. So first, one, the recipients of Peter's letters were, according to Peter, the elect, ex elect exiles, that is, a people chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, verse 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul had something to say regarding God's foreknowledge and salvation when he, in his letter to Ephesus, said this, he chose us, that is, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. That's the first point. Second point, the elect exiles were chosen, according to Peter, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. Again, verse 2. In other words, we know they were Christians because Christians 
from a biblical standpoint of view, are Christians solely by the regenerating and sanctifying work of, of God the Holy Spirit, which enables a Christian, by the power of the Holy Spirit, to obey Jesus, to follow Jesus. And we see that Peter really here is highlighting that holiness and obedience, we'll see more of that as we move through this letter in the weeks to come, holiness and obedience are marks of a genuine Christian. And this means, folks, some other things too. It means that salvation is more than going to heaven when you and I die, but that our sanctification and our obedience to Christ is lived out or made manifest daily here on earth in each and every circumstance of our lives. Apostle Peter went on to remind the elect exiles that in God's mercy, again repeating some of the stuff that I've already mentioned, but just to make emphasis here, that because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they had received a new nature. Uh, Peter, uh, that is translated here in the ESV, probably in yours as well, your translation, born again in verse 3. In other words, they were spiritually made alive by the Holy Spirit through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in part and parcel, we see here Peter describing that this new birth was a living hope, verse 3, and that the recipients of this living hope had an inheritance waiting for them in heaven, verse 4, an imperishable, undefiled, unfading inheritance to be revealed at the last time, Peter would say, verse 5, on the return of Jesus Christ. And this brings us to our text, as I mentioned earlier, to today, verse 6 to 9. Notice with me that these four verses, as you look at them now in your Bibles, are bookended, if you will, by an attitude of rejoicing, an attitude of joy. The Apostle Peter began his letter, again, I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit here for emphasis, by highlighting the mercy of God in Christ, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God in Christ had caused the elect exiles to be saved. And this was not only, my friends, a sure hope in Christ, as I already mentioned, this was a living hope, or Peter mentioned. A hope that in Christ, that Christ in them was with them in everyday uh, circumstances of their lives. That by faith their salvation would one day be fully realized when Jesus returned, and then they would receive their promised eternal inheritance. And with all that God had done in his mercy, for he is a merciful God for the elect exiles. Peter now would exhort, it's in this that you rejoice, in this you rejoice, verse 6. For the mercy and kindness of God in Christ had brought a people described by Peter in chapter 2, verse 10, as not a people to be God's people, same chapter and verse. A people who at one time, as Peter described them here in chapter 1, verse 14, conformed to the passions of their former ignorance, to a people Peter called in chapter um, 2, verse 9, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. My friends, indeed, the elect exiles had much to rejoice about. And we want to just repeat what Peter said in this, you rejoice. But the apostle Peter goes on, and he said, in this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. The original Greek here, translated by the ESV, which I use, that phrase, if necessary, is translated by the NIV, you may have had to, and the New King James Version puts it this way, if need be. Now, let's take a closer look at that original Greek. It's a verb that is translated, as I said, in uh, the ESV here, necessary. We're going to see how it works in the grammatical construction of, in, its, uh, in its origin. What it is, we find, is a present active role here. This verb is in a present active role. That's the way I'll describe it to you. Which means the action the verb describes is in process. In other words, it's happening at the present time. So the question is, what was going on with the elect exiles that Peter highlighted by using this Greek verb that we have translated, if necessary? Because these various trials they had been grieved by, verse 6. Now the apostle, unfortunately, doesn't go on to explain the nature of these various trials that these elect exiles were experiencing. So we have to ask, what do we know then? Well, staying with uh, the boundaries of the text, we know that trials, the trials being experienced by the believers, according to the original meaning, were diverse and varied. 
That's what the adjective various means in its original sense. So whatever the trials the believers were experiencing, their suffering came from a variety of sources. And even the trials themselves were varied. We can get some idea also by the dating of Peter's letter, which the majority of scholars I found would place just prior to Nero's persecutions. We find evidence in other New Testament letters as well that first century believers would be persecuted for their faith in all areas of culture, all stratas of culture, whether it be from family, whether it be from neighbors, whether it be from workplaces, businesses, etc. All stratas of society at times would persecute the Christians in that early first century. And then at times, local governments and even the national government at the time when this letter was written, the Roman Empire would also be a source of persecution. Whatever the source of their trials, however, the Apostle Peter's audience, again, as I mentioned earlier, were grieved by various trials that had test tested their faith in Christ. So as we just kind of continue to dig a little bit here, we are reminded that in Peter's letter, right here from the beginning, these first nine verses, we see it, uh, uh, that you'll find rising to the surface an emphasis, an emphasis, an emphasis. Again, word, terrible words for me. Uh, an emphasis on Christian suffering. In other words, suffering is normative for you and me as believers, as it was for them. Apostle Peter would go on to emphasize his, his theme when he said in chapter 4, verse 12, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was, were, something strange were happening to you. Again, chapter 4, verse 12. The news source, the Washington Strand, which is going to go off topic here. Well, it's on topic, just to modern days. The Washington Stand ran a story back in February uh, 19th, uh, 2023, of Jessica Tapai, or Tapi, Tapai, I think, uh, who was a mother of three, who was a physical education teacher at Jerupa Unifi Unified School District in California. Jessica was fired uh, for refusing to tell lies about the bio biological reality or hide students' gender transition, transitions from their parents. Uh, so Jessica ended up being served with a notice of unprofessional conduct for not embracing the district's new policies promoting transgender identities. I think it was around, um, if I understood that uh, article, around January 31st of that year that Jessica was fired after the district determined they could not accommodate her religious beliefs. And this was part of Jessica's response, which I'm trying very hard to quote exactly. Jessica said, quote, I knew immediately in my heart and my soul that there was a decision I had to make because these two things were totally butting heads. I essentially had to pick one. Am I going to obey the district and the directives that are not lining up with my beliefs, my convictions, and my faith? Or am I going to stay, stay the course, chase, stay true, I mean, uh, and choose my faith the way the Lord has called me to live, end quote. Friends, when it comes to pain and suffering, Everyone, no matter what they believe or not believe, will experience their share of pain and suffering in this life. However, Apostle Paul was addressing followers of Christ, like Jessica, who were grieved by various trials. The source was a variety, yet the reason for their grief was because the Apostle Peter's audience, like Jessica, chose to live in their context the way the Lord had called them to, called them to live. Pardon me. And this brings the question that I want to challenge you with. Challenge you with how about you? Are you living your, your faith in the public spaces as you do in the private spaces? Are you living your faith in those spaces as the Lord has called you to? Are you a Christian 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, year in and year out? Or maybe just a couple hours a week during the church service? So friends, here's the first takeaway. If you have a pen, write this down. The first takeaway we have from the text here is suffering for a Christian is inevitable. Suffering for a Christian is inevitable. Apostle Paul even mentions this in the letter to Romans. We rejoice in our sufferings. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. James, in his letter at the very beginning, verse 2, 
James said, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. It's quite remarkable or maybe unremarkable, depending how you want to say it. The New Testament teaching concerning Christian suffering butts up right against the question of the day. Why does God allow suffering? Notice how Peter answers the question. Uh, uh, the question that possibly these first century Christians were asking. Why does God allow suffering in a believer's life? Peter said, so that the test of genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in the praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's verse 7. So let's take a look at this idea here, or this phrase, the tested genuineness of your faith, verse 7. James, in his letter, said something similar to what Peter said here. James said, for you know that the testing of your faith, and then there's something after, and we'll get to that in a second. We can go back to the Old Testament and find Job's answer to where God was in his pain and suffering. If you know the story of Job, it was quite a bit of it. Job said, but he, that is God, knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. Job 23, verse 10. We can go through the whole Bible, folks. From Genesis right through to Revelation and find places after places that indicate clearly God tests his people in the crucible of life. C.S. Lewis once said, quote, I suggest to you it is because God loves us that he gives us the gift of suffering. The blows of his chisel, which hurt us so much, are what make us perfect. Former pastor and theologian J.I. Packer once said, quote, God uses chronic pain and weaknesses, along with other afflictions, as his chisel for sculpting our lives. Felt weaknesses deepens our dependence on Christ each day. We go back to James' letter who said this, the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Do you understand that? Isn't that interesting? James chapter 1, verse 3. The Apostle Paul, back in his letter, we'll go back to the letter to Rome that he wrote, he said this, but we rejoice in our suffering. There's that joy again. Knowing that suffering, Paul would say, produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. So the first takeaway, get your pens ready, suffering is inevitable. Second takeaway, suffering is necessary. And I want to be clear, not all suffering in your life is a test from God, but all suffering tests your faith in God. You know, the secular culture, as we ponder that uh, worldview, materialistic worldview, seeks control in all areas of life. Our text today reveals that we are not in control, but Jesus is. This includes our pain and suffering. Listen to the prayer of King David when he said, Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. Psalm 31.5. I mean, this is the attitude of David's heart. He committed uh, his spirit into God's loving hand. The Apostle Paul understood the necessity of suffering for Christ, for when he said, we suffer for it with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Romans chapter 8, verse 17. Apostle Peter also understood, as these other uh, Bible uh, biblical uh, personalities did, that, so that he would write that the various trials the believers uh, experienced accomplished a refining work in their faith, a faith that was more precious than gold that perishes, Peter would say, and like gold, gold, like God, like gold that is refined by fire, their faith was tested, uh, as we heard earlier from Peter, in the fiery trials of life, chapter 4, verse 12. All this resulting, my friends, in the praise and glory and honor to God at the return of Jesus, verse 7. So one, suffering is inevitable, suffering is necessary, and last but not least, suffering is beneficial. Now you're probably saying, hold it, didn't you just say earlier, why would anyone want to suffer? Well, let's ask the Apostle Peter, and let's hear his answer. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 8 and 9. So here we have the completed set of bookends of joy. 
began with joy, ends with joy. And Peter describes this kind of joy as inexpressible, translated in the ESV, inexpressible. It's a good translation, I believe, of the original word, the original Greek, I mean. But I think also the description of that original Greek tells us that Peter not only points this out as inexpressible joy, but we could also say indescribable joy. Indeed, how can one express, if you think about it, or how can one describe something that is so filled with the glory of God? And notice that this inexpressible joy that one, uh, that one has because of their faith in Jesus Christ has a beneficial outcome. Peter said the salvation of your souls. Apostle Paul's commentary helps us as he described the righteousness one receives through faith in Christ and some of the other benefits that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming more like him in death than by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. You see, my friends, for a believer in the ancient days that Peter was writing, for you and me today, fast far removed from that time and culture, what greater benefit can there be for suffering and enduring pain than the salvation of our souls and the resurrection from the dead. Suffering is inevitable. Suffering is necessary. And suffering is beneficial. Let us pray. I want to thank you, Lord, for this good word from your word. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence in our lives by your spirit. Thank you that you redeemed us. We were not a people. Now we are the people of God. Not of anything that we did, but by faith alone, uh, by grace alone, by believing on your Son and the finished work of the cross. And we thank you, Lord. And I pray for my friends that are listening. I pray, God, that you would bless them, the top of their heads, the bottom of their feet. That you would surround them, protect them, watch over them. And may they, may they give God all the glory in their lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Shalom.